Hey, hi, how are you? Hey, hello. Uh, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So let's get started with the interview. Uh, I would like to ask you some questions about Java, then we'll hmm. go through Spring Boot and microservices. So let's get started with the coding. Okay. okay. So uh, do you know Java 8 uh, stream APIs? Yes, yes, I know Java 8 stream APIs. Okay, so you can define a list of numbers and you have to find the second highest number from that list. So you can consider your own list and start writing the code. Okay, so I have to uh, define a list of integer and from that list of integer, I have to find the second as. Am I right? Yes, correct. Okay, so let me start by creating a class. I'll I'll try to, to find uh, second highest. I'm also going to add the main method to it so that this is going to be starting point of my application. And then I'm going to finish it. Uh, so the first step is to define a list. What I'll do, I'll take a list of uh, integer. And I'm going to call this as numbers equal to new, uh, not new, arrays dot as list. And I'm going to define one, five, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so these are my numbers. I'm going to import a uh, list and array list. So let's try to import list and arrays, both of them. Right, so I'll write the problem statement here first. Mm -hmm. Find the second highest number using uh, Java Steam APIs. APIs. Okay, now let's try to uh, solve this numbers dot the first step is to get the stream out of your list. So I'm going to get the stream. Now, once I get the stream, uh, I'm going to do distinct to get the distinct element. Suppose if some of the numbers are repeated twice. So I want to remove uh, those numbers and consider them only once. Once I take the distinct, then I'm going to sort this list in descending order. So the big bigger number will come first and then from there uh, it will keep on descending. For that I'm going to use sorted. So sorted accepts a comparator. So it compares two numbers. So those two numbers are going to be A and B in our case. And uh, as we have to sort in descending order, we are going to return B minus A. So this will help us sort the number in uh, descending order. So once I sort the number, as we want to find the second highest, we are going to skip the first number. So I'm going to skip the first number. And then we have to take the number that we find after that. For that, we will do find first. Okay. So this will give me the optional. Let me take this in optional. The optional is a construct where value can be either present or uh, won't be present. So this is optional of integer. So I'll give uh, optional equal to this, right? After this, I am going to get the result uh, optional dot get. Okay, so this will give me the result, and this will be an integer result. Integer second highest. Okay, and finally, I am going to uh, print print the number. So let's try to print second highest. Okay. So I'll I'll try to uh, run this. Okay. Mm, so second highest in our case is uh, eight because the first highest is nine and uh, the second highest is eight. So here is the program using Java eight streams. Okay. And what is that skip method used for? Uh, skip. So once I sort the elements, so the elements will be nine, eight, seven, five, one, and one. So it will be sorted in descending order. Then I have to skip the first element, which is nine. So that is where we are going to get the second uh, number. We are skipping the first, and then we are targeting the second element. And that optional is used for? Optional is used, uh, for example, uh, sometimes we don't have results. Uh, in that case, we use optional. Optional is where the result can either be present or cannot be present. So it gives you some of the methods where you can check if the value is present or not present, and then you can fetch the value from option. Okay, good. So do you know the collections? Yeah, I know collections. 
So what are the collections which you have used in your project? Yeah, right. So uh, interfaces, I've used uh, a list uh, map. And when it comes to the implementation, I have used array list, uh, hash map, uh, link list, concurrent hash map. Okay. Can you tell me the difference between hash map and a concurrent hash map? Okay, so hash map uh, is a key value pair and even concurrent hash map is a key value pair, but there is a basic difference in terms of uh, thread safety. So hash map is not thread safe and concurrent hash map is thread safe. Uh, for example, if multiple threads are trying to access hash map, that can uh, result in inconsistent state of the hash map. So to solve this problem, uh, Java came up with concurrent hash map where multiple threads can access concurrent hash map without making the result inconsistent. So in case of concurrent hash map, there's a concept of uh, segments. So you divide your concurrent hash map into multiple segments and each thread can access uh, one segment at a time. So if there are four threads and four segments and four threads can concurrently access four segments and they can make changes in those segments. So that is how uh, concurrent hash map, uh, uh, the working concurrent hash map is done. Okay, fine. Uh, do you have any experience working with uh, threads in Java? Yeah, yeah, I have experience working with threads. Okay. Have you heard about volatile keyword or synchronized keyword in Java? Mm, yeah, yeah, correct. So uh, I'll start with synchronized. So when you try okay. to uh, try to uh, run your uh, programs related to threads, so there is uh, something called as critical section. The critical section uh, is a piece of code that only one thread can execute at a time. So if two threads are trying to execute that section uh, at the same time, so that will uh, result in problems. So that is where synchronized comes into picture. So when you say some method is synchronized, so that method can execute that that method can be executed by one thread at a time. So uh, that is the significance of synchronized keyword. Uh, whenever you mark something as synchronized, then only one thread can enter into that block or that method and execute it. Right, so this is about a uh, synchronized uh, method and uh, volatile is where um, uh, when you mark uh, your variable as volatile, then it will uh, make sure that no thread will cache that uh, value and that will always be read from the memory. So whenever thread one wants to read it, it will go to the memory and read it. And when thread two wants to read it, it will go to the uh, uh, memory and read it. So no one is going to cache it uh, at their level. So that is where volatile comes into picture. Okay, so you said that volatile will be used to read the data from memory directly, right? Correct, correct. And no caching so mechanism. You know... Okay, and do you know the Java's memory model? Uh, yeah, so Java memory model uh, is basically uh, the Java, uh, when you run your program, then uh, some of the memory is allocated in your RAM uh, for a heap. So that is your heap memory. Now your heap memory is divided into uh, multiple uh, sections. Uh, known as uh, young young generation, old generation, and permanent generation. So young generation is where newly created objects live, okay? And old generation is where uh, when your object uh, reaches some age, then they are shifted to old generation. And there are some objects uh, which permanently reside in your heap. Uh, so that, that resides in your permanent generation. So when it comes to garbage collection, your young generation uh, uh, area is garbage collected frequently. So, and your old generation less frequently and permanent generation is uh, never garbage collected. And in some cases, very less garbage collected. So this, this is the memory model of uh, Java. Okay, good. Okay, uh, do you know string class in Java? Stream? String. Spring. Spring, spring. String, yeah, I know string class. So that string class is immutable, right? Correct, yeah. Okay, now can you tell me if I need to create a class which is immutable similar to string? So can you do it or how to do it? Okay. Do you know how uh, to make it immutable? Uh, correct, correct. So immutable is where when once you construct the object, the state of that object cannot be changed. For example, if I create a string ABC and if I want to append a PQR to the string, then the existing string does not change. Uh, when you append PQR, a new string will be created. So this is the concept of um, immutability. Now, how to achieve uh, this in Java? So to uh, achieve this, 
the first thing that we do is make a class and mark that class as final so that no no one should be able to extend that class and uh, the second thing is uh, we define variables uh, so for those variables uh, we only define uh, setter methods we don't define getter methods so this is how uh, we are only able to uh, set uh, the values of the fields and uh, we should never uh, we should never be able to uh, give me a moment so we define setter methods uh, can you give me a hint over here? Mm, okay. So you should not be able to set the values, right? You should be able to retry the values or read the values. So you need okay. to provide the getters only, right? Getters only. So what we do, uh, we define a constructor. Okay. And in mm. constructor, we provide uh, the values. So we don't provide the setter methods. We only provide the getter methods because we should only be able to get the value. We should never be able to set the value. So that is where we skip the setter methods. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, so how do you handle exceptions in your programming? Uh, okay. All right. So there are two types of exceptions. Uh, one is the checked exception and one is the unchecked exception. And for unchecked exceptions, we also tell that as runtime exception. Okay. So checked exceptions are the one which you are forced to handle. For example, IO exception. Okay. So this is a, a, a checked exception. Whenever there is a checked exception, uh, then you have to surround that with a, a try catch block. For example, like this, okay, IO exception. And for unchecked exception, uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, surround it with a try catch, try catch block. And generally, unchecked exceptions are your logical problems. For example, um, consider this. I create a string str equal to uh, null, for example, and then I do str dot uh, caret zero. So this is going to uh, return a null pointer exception. So this is my runtime exception. And as you can see, I am not handling it. So let's uh, run this program. Okay, so it gives you null pointer exception, but I don't have to surround this with a try catch block. So this is my unchecked exception or runtime exception. Okay. And what is that catch block is used for if you surround it with try catch block? Okay, so catch catch block is used to uh, catch the exception and do some uh, processing. For example, let me do this. Uh, try uh, catch, and I'm going to catch uh, exception E. Okay, so whenever there is a problem in try, for example, uh, let's do this int i equal to uh, five. Okay, and then what I do, I do i uh, equal to i divided by zero okay and we know that when we divide something uh, by zero then we are going to get the exception uh, let's try this whenever there is an exception we perform something so for example we do logging or we throw another runtime exception for our case to make it simpler uh, i'm going to sys out um exception uh, during division okay all right so now i run this program and you see exception during division Okay, so we should never try to do this. We should always check if the denominator is zero and if it is zero, then we should not go ahead with the division operation. No, okay. But do you have experience on Spring Boot and microservices as well, right? Uh, yeah, I have worked on Spring Boot and microservices as well. Okay, so what are the advantages of Spring Boot over earlier version of Spring? Can you tell me a few advantages of Spring Boot? Correct. So uh, there are various advantages of Spring Boot. Uh, for example, in Spring, um, we have to write a lot of boilerplate code. We have to manage dependency. So in case of Spring Boot, uh, they came up with uh, uh, starter dependency. For example, Spring Boot starter web. Okay. So in case of earlier version, for example, Spring, whenever you want to write REST APIs, then you have to um, manage the dependency yourself. Uh, you have to go to your pom.xml and define all the compatible dependencies yourself. So for example, for web, you need a uh, Jackson dependency. So you need to uh, maintain the version of Jackson and you need to maintain the compatible version of all the dependencies. So in case of uh, Spring Boot, uh, uh, there is a concept of starter uh, web dependency. So if you just add the descriptor, a uh, Spring Boot starter web, it brings all the uh, jars required to build REST APIs. So uh, that is the first advantage. The second advantage is um, auto configuration, where um, if uh, based on the Mm, jar that you put in your class bar. So based on the dependencies, Spring Boot uh, actually 
creates beans for you. For example, if you add uh, the dependency for uh, uh, the database in your uh, Spring Boot, then Spring Boot will uh, create a data source of bean automatically for you. And the third advantage is uh, it has embedded Tomcat. For example, uh, if you create a web application, then in the earlier um, versions of uh, Spring, you have to create a jar or war file and deploy it into your uh, Tomcat. So Spring Boot has given a mechanism where there is embedded Tomcat and you don't have to uh, deploy a jar or a war. Uh, if you start your jar, uh, that automatically gets uh, deployed to your embedded Tomcat and starts running on a port. So these are the few advantages of Spring Boot over uh, Spring. Okay. And how do you handle exceptions in your Spring Boot project? Okay. So uh, there are uh, exceptions at two level. Uh, the first exception is at the global level and the second exception uh, is at the uh, method level. So uh, the global level exception, you can handle it using advice, controller advice annotation and uh, the method at the, uh, the exception at the method level, you can uh, handle it using at the right exception handler. Okay. So whenever uh, any exception happens, then in that case, uh, the response that we send back to the client is in the form of status code. So generally, whenever there is an exception, you map the associated exception to the status code, and then you send back that status code as a response to the request. Okay. So what are the different HTTP status codes which you have used in your project? Okay. So we have used uh, several status code. Uh, for example, uh, we have used uh, 401 where the user is unauthenticated. Uh, then we have used 403 where uh, the user is trying to access a resource, but uh, he's forbidden to access that resource. Mm, then after that, 404, 404 where the user is trying to access something, but uh, that resource is not present onto your server. Um, then I have also used uh, 429 where you are making a lot of requests to the server. But uh, uh, those many requests are not allowed at a time uh, for a server. This is a concept of rate limiting for four to nine and 500 where uh, there is any internal server problem or internal server error has happened during execution of the uh, program. So these are few that I've used. Okay, you mentioned 401 as unauthorized. Can you tell me what is the difference between authentication and authorization? All right. So authentication is where uh, you tell the system who you are. For example, when I'm trying to log into Facebook, uh, then I give my user ID and password. So this way I tell Facebook that I'm Tofik. Uh, so in authentication, you tell who you are. And in authorization, actually authorization is where uh, you tell what section of program, what section of software you can access. Okay, so authentication is who you are and uh, authorization is where you are permitted to access uh, which part of the uh, software. Okay, and do you know the profiles in your Spring Boot? Uh, yeah, so profile is where you can have a uh, conditional configuration or conditional beans based on the different uh, environments. For example, there are three environments, uh, dev, UAT, and production, and you want different configuration for all these three environments, then you can have uh, three different profiles, one for dev, one for Q, and one for production. And uh, while starting up your application, you can set up the active profile spring.profiles.active is the uh, uh, key which you can use and you can uh, pass uh, the name of the profile which you want to mark as active. So that active uh, profile configuration will be picked uh, during startup and that will be used uh, throughout the uh, program. Okay, good. Can you explain me uh, the architecture of your project? How it is designed? Yeah. Is it based on microservices or is it monolithic architecture? All right. So earlier my project was monolithic, then we shifted to microservices. So now it is a uh, microservices architecture. So my project is uh, divided into multiple uh, microservices. Okay. So there's microservice one, microservice two, and microservice three. So generally, whenever client wants to uh, make a request to my project, so client will generally uh, give a request to the API gateway. And API gateway in turn will communicate uh, to all the microservices. Okay, so the first component uh, that resides is my API gateway that is implemented in uh, Zool. So Zool is the API gateway. Then uh, we have microservices, which are uh, small Spring Boot applications. Okay, and whenever they start up, uh, they register uh, themselves uh, with something called as a uh, discovery server, which is uh, Eureka. Okay, so whenever a, a microservice starts, uh, it registers itself with the discovery server. 
So uh, if I have three microservices, then all three microservices will register themselves with the discovery server. And when one microservice wants to um, communicate with the other microservice, then the address of that microservices uh, will be given uh, by the discovery server rather than hard coding in that microservice. So that is the second uh, uh, aspect. Third is each microservice has its uh, own database. So only that microservice is allowed to uh, communicate with the database and get the uh, data from it. So no other microservice can directly communicate uh, to the database. They will always go uh, through the REST API um, to uh, get the data. And for uh, monitoring and for uh, the, uh, all this, we use Actuator. So every microservice has Actuator in it. And we go ahead and uh, hit the Actuator URL uh, to get the uh, performance and monitoring information. Okay. So you had a monolithic architecture and now you are converting it into microservice-based architecture, right? Correct. So what is it which by which means through which you decided that I will go for microservices architecture and not for monolithic architecture? Okay. Okay. So All what right. were the advantages of microservices architecture over your monolith architecture? Correct. So monolithic is where um, there is one big application. Okay, so one big application and one big team. And if I want to change something, then that change, after that change, I need to test the entire application. Okay, and also uh, I need to scale the individual components. For example, uh, the first thing is consider Amazon application. So we have uh, buyer functionality, we have seller functionality, we have payment functionality, and we have notification functionality. For example, I'm getting a lot of requests for my payment functionality. So consider this as one big monolithic application. Then to scale this application, I have to do two deployments. But uh, as you can see, I just want to scale up my payment related aspect. I don't want to scale the entire application. Still, I have to do two deployments. So that is the reason we thought of dividing our application into microservices, where we can scale the individual components rather than the entire application. So now the application look like, uh, looks like uh, uh, buyer uh, microservice, seller microservice, uh, payment microservice, and notification microservice. Now, if I want to scale up the payment microservice, what we do, we just make two deployments of our payment microservice uh, rather than the entire application. And each uh, component, each microservice is managed by uh, different teams. So now that we have autonomous teams who can manage uh, the microservices uh, themselves. Uh, so they just send the contract to the uh, other team and then they consume uh, uh, the APIs using that contract. Okay. Okay, and how these microservices communicate with each other? Okay, uh, so there are two ways of communication. Uh, one is synchronous way where uh, uh, microservice one calls microservice two, then microservice one has to wait until microservice two responds back and both the parties have to be present. So this is a synchronous communication and this generally happens over uh, HTTP, okay? Where both the parties are present, so we use either a REST client or find client, a REST template or find client to do this kind of uh, communication. Then the second type of communication is asynchronous, where uh, uh, you can do the communication, but whenever the second party becomes available, it will respond back. So uh, in the second case, we have something called as a message broker or a event stream. For example, Kafka in between. So uh, microservice one publishes something to Kafka. And then microservice two consumes that thing from Kafka and does the operation. So uh, synchronous and asynchronous are the two ways of communication. Okay, and you said that your microservices are per database, means you have a separate database for each microservice. Yeah, correct. Okay, so do you see any challenges associated with your database management? Oh, correct. So uh, there are several uh, challenges when it comes to microservices, for example, one of the biggest challenges is uh, uh, keeping the data consistent is the uh, big challenge. So as uh, it is into multiple data store, so transaction management becomes very difficult in case of microservices. And data consistency is also one uh, challenge, but there are uh, various mechanisms. For example, um, uh, Saga, uh, you can use orchestration or choreography Saga uh, for transaction, and that will help you maintain the consistency of your uh, data in case of microservices architect. Okay, and uh, let us consider there is a query which is taking too much time to read the data from the database. So in that scenario, how do you handle this situation? Okay, so uh, the first thing that we do, uh, uh, the query that is uh, taking a lot of time, the first thing we do is to check the where clause. 
uh, if where clause is using any of the columns uh, where um, if there are indexes on those columns if uh, we are using something in a where clause and if that column does not have index then it takes a lot of time uh, if that is the case then we try to check can we use columns which are already indexed and if uh, we don't find any such column then we try to add indexes uh, to the tables so this uh, increases improves the uh, time of the query the second thing that we uh, check is uh, query execution plan. So based on the query execution plan, we get a lot of details. And uh, based on that, we can optimize our uh, query further to make a better execution uh, plan. So that is the uh, second thing. And the third thing is uh, we try to denormalize uh, some uh, data. So that denormalized data, uh, with that case, uh, we avoid a lot of joins and uh, uh, that also increases the performance of the query okay great so i'm done from my side how do you have any question for me uh no i don't have any questions and thank thank you for your time